Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is Solar Viewing, Imaging, and Animations presented by Warren Spring. But before I go into that, a uh, couple things. First of all, if you want to get in on the chat, go to our website, click the chat module, just sign right in and you'll be in in the conversation and uh, it'll all work out. Uh, then um, the other thing I wanted to do was, I, I hope they're on there. Yeah, okay, there we go. I see one viewer. There we go. Um, the other thing I want to do was uh, show off our image of the week, which uh, this week's image of the week goes to Chris Massa, and it is Thor's helmet, NGC 2359. Uh, and uh, you can check it out on our website to get some further description on it. And beyond that, I am, ooh, sorry, clicking the wrong windows here. Uh, I am going to hand it right over to Warren, who is in the room. And Warren, I'm here. It's all you. Okay, let's, let's see how this works here. All right, Put that up. Yep. And hopefully, full screen here in a minute. It's loading. <laughs> okay there we go got it okay good um so if any questions come up adam go ahead and uh stop me and we can ask these um a couple of disclaimers to start with i start talking about some of the equipment the scopes and so forth i am not a an expert on the physics and the engineering of these things so if I say something uh, out of turn or anything, please feel free to correct me. Anybody in the room or outside, you can uh, put in a chat and correct me if I uh, say something wrong. I have no problem with that. Uh, real quickly, just a little history on how I got interested in solar. All the way back in 1963, when my grandfather bought me and my brothers a three-inch Tasco Newtonian, and it came with the dreaded eyepiece solar filter, the thing that they always say never ever use, and so forth and so on. I think it probably was a piece of uh, you know welder's glass put on a little filter that you screwed into your eyepiece, and then you went and looked at the sun. And we did that and had no issues. Looked at solar, you know, solar spots, sunspots, etc. And then one day that my brother was looking at it, he backed away from it and was I was about ready to look into it and I saw this bright light coming out of the eyepiece thought maybe I ought to check it and yeah it had cracked from the heat etc so you take those warnings uh, correctly if you're going to look at the sun you want to make sure everything is taken care of uh, move on to 2004 and I got a uh, large 8 inch Dobsonian and got to see the uh, transit of Venus got a picture by holding my camera up to the eyepiece and got that. I got into actual imaging back in 2010 and started seeing more on uh, HA, you know, hydrogen alpha imaging, etc., viewing the sun, and knew that the next uh, Venus pass was coming up in 2012. Decided to get the uh, a Lunt 60 millimeter HA scope. And of course, the day of the transit, it was cloudy here and I never did get to see it. But I, that, that kind of got me into the uh, imaging of uh, solar, et cetera. And we're gonna talk about HA, but we're gonna talk about uh, some of the other wavelengths as well, uh, how to get started in this. I've seen a lot of activity over in the solar observing and imaging, you know, people with the solar eclipse coming up asking about which scope to get, you know, how to set up etc. And so I thought, hey, you know, I have a great time with this. Uh, you don't have to have a dark site. You don't have to worry about light pollution. Uh, the cameras are inexpensive. Some of the scopes are expensive, but the cameras are expensive. And really, I found that, you know, getting into this uh, kind of stretched the, the way I could use my equipment. So let me use a little pointer here. So start out you always want to grab your audience's attention so this is a you know, full disc and this is probably the most dramatic thing i ever witnessed or caught uh, on an animation 
this was a prom lifting off. This is basically after, this is the same prom, same day. But I had started to image this, and this is over an hour's time. And I started seeing that, oh, this thing's starting to lift off. And I kept you know, going and going, so I, I went for an hour. You can actually see it's actually lifting off the surface here, not the limb. And after it got basically out of my frame, I drew back, and this is how far it was going out here. So you estimate the length of this. This is about if the Earth was here, the moon would be up about here, which, you know, those types of things are fascinating. And uh, it's one of those things that hopefully this will pique some of your interest. And if you've got uh, some money around, you don't know what to spend it on, uh, maybe we'll give you some ideas here. So what are types, you know, viewing and imaging? There's, of course, white light, which most people get into first. Uh, it's fairly inexpensive, and you can do visual too. And we'll talk about what you can see, what you can image, et cetera, et cetera with that. Hydrogen alpha, you know, to many people and me, it's king. Uh, it is expensive. The scopes are expensive. You can do visual too with it. And we'll talk about uh, the various ways you can uh, view the sun in hydrogen alpha. Uh, a less used one is the calcium K line. Uh, this is another fairly expensive uh, option. I say no visual because the uh, calcium K line is uh, close to the ultraviolet. If uh, you put one of these on and you look in, you might see a very purple disc, but that's about it. You really won't see too many uh, um, details, etc. Now, as an exception, I noticed that uh, Daystar with their quark they do have a calcium H line, and they say that can be used visually, and that uh, you know the details, et cetera, are pretty much the same. Uh, some other ones, uh, sodium D line, helium, they're rarely used, uh, very expensive, et cetera. So going at looking at white light, how do you look at it? Uh, there's a number of options that you can do. You can go with glass filters. Uh, you know they'll run somewhere between a, you know eighty. To $150 depending upon the size and you can get full aperture for smaller scopes and off-axis so you get into really large scopes cut down on the cost uh, you can use an off-axis one a glass filter and they give pretty decent views but I will tell you that in talking with a lot of the people that view white light and image in white light that's probably the least used as the glass filters the most used is the film. And this is uh, an example of batter uh, solar film. It's fairly inexpensive. You can make your own. Uh, there's been guys that'll take an embroidery hoop, uh, some felt, stretch the film across. It does not have to be perfectly flat. Uh, and it gives very nice detailed views of the sun. It's fairly inexpensive. Now, the thing you need to worry about is make sure that it's attached securely to the scope and it can over time develop pinholes. It is fairly fragile. You need to you know, be careful with how you handle it, et cetera. You know, it's, it's not as durable as glass, but they claim it gives uh, much better views. I've not actually used the film uh, myself. I've had the glass and then I moved down. I uh, just recently got about a year ago, the Herschel wedge. Uh, what these do, they basically replace your diagonal. When they come in, they use different mirrors, et cetera, to direct only about oh, four, three to four percent of the light coming up. The rest of it comes into these ceramic areas uh, to deflect the heat. This is the uh, lunt. This is the batter. And you'll notice with the uh, batter one, you can actually use it for aligning the sun too, because the uh, image of the sun goes into this ceramic area. You can actually see it and as you're lining up, etc. These run, the lint runs about 250. The batter, because it comes with a solar continuum uh, filter as well, as long as some neutral densities, these run close to $700. So this is the most expensive option. Um, people that have used both these and the film say there's a slight increase in the quality of the image and the uh, viewing 
between these two. So if you're starting out, uh, the film seems to be the best one that uh, you can utilize. And what do you see? This is with my 80 millimeter scope. And this was with a glass filter. Uh, and there's some people over on the uh, solar imaging that uh, image with C14s. And some of their shots of the surface are really amazing. But with white light, uh, you're looking at the photosphere. You're going to see the sunspot. You're going to see the umbras, the penumbras. You're going to see faculi, these lighter areas like this. And you're going to see the pebbling or convection currents, basically. And the larger the scope, of course, the more detail you're going to get as long as you're seeing is good. And some of the images I've seen, this looks like a cobblestone street. Uh, and some of the details inside the sunspots are really amazing with white light. Of course, at this point in time, we're starting to get into solar minimum. Uh, we all got excited because a sunspot came across the other day, and it's about the size of this one right here. And the rest of the sun is pretty much blank at this point in time. So that's pretty much what you'll uh, get into when you start looking at white light. And when I talk about the imaging, the imaging is the same for white light, for calcium K, for hydrogen alpha. Uh, pretty much the steps are the same. Uh, they're just going to see different areas of the sun. I'll talk about the calcium K, the calcium H line. Uh, this is the Lunt filter. Uh, the nice thing about calcium K, calcium H, you don't have to buy a specialized telescope for it. Uh, this fits on my 80 millimeter uh, Orion scope. Uh, you'll see it basically has a rejection filter for getting out rid of most of the light and then different uh, lenses and so forth to uh, view the calcium K. Batter has an actual, it's a double stacked filter, uh, basically an eyepiece filter. They ship their film with it to, has to go over the front of the scope because you've got to get rid of most of the light coming in. And then they say this is only to be used for photography it allows too much ultraviolet light coming through, which is uh, harmful to your eyes over time. Uh, it's a fairly inexpensive way. I, th I think the filter itself with the uh, film is about $100. Um, it doesn't give quite the detail that the more expensive, uh, the lint runs right about $1,000. And then this is Daystar's uh, calcium hydrogen cork. And you'll notice all the quarks require power. I believe all the Daystar filters that they manufacture uh, require power. Uh, they use heat for getting their things into the correct bandwidths, etc. You'll see the on-off switch and so forth. And uh, this one they claim can be used for visual as well as uh, taking uh, photography with it. Um, I haven't, again, with the quarks, I have not used those. I have not used this. I currently use the uh, Lunt blocking filter. And this is an image with in the calcium K line through my 80 millimeter. This is, you know, the full disc. The nice thing with it is it's just a little bit above basically the photosphere. You get a lot more detail in the phage around uh, sunspots. This is showing a lot of magnetic activity. You see areas that are showing up like this are possible new sunspots that could be forming here. Um, you'll see a lot when you get in close, of course, you see a lot of detail within the sunspots themselves, a lot of the supercells in the sun and the activity around them going on. And you'll see most of these shots, people like to color them purple because that's pretty much what they look like if you uh, have a chance to get through and your eyes are young, not older like mine. But that's what you get with the uh, calcium K line. And moving on to the one that most people get interested in after they get into white light, and that's the hydrogen alpha. And I'm gonna show the two most uh, popular ways of doing hydrogen alpha, the dedicated scopes, and then the new quark uh, eyepiece hydrogen alpha. Now, this is not the only way you can do that, uh, you can do things with front mounted filters, etc., on regular scopes. You just have to have the right equipment. You need uh, an Edelon, 
which is basically the mechanism that cuts all the light out except for the hydrogen alpha band. And when we talk about hydrogen alpha, because we get this question on the solar observing and imaging uh, forum, people ask, can I use my HA filter that I do astrophotography with? And understand that those filters, you're talking seven down to three nanometers. With hydrogen alpha, we're talking about 0.7 and 0.5 angstroms are the wavelengths or the bandwidths. So that's where the expense comes in doing this, is in with the etalons, the blocking filters, the things basically to make it safe to look at. When you take a look at the uh, self-contained scopes, the two main brands, the Lunt and the Coronado, now owned by Mead, and the one that a lot of people get started with, the Coronado PST, which is the least expensive way to get into solar imaging or viewing. It's a 40 millimeter scope, uh, pretty simple. Um, and I've seen some images with, and some people get some really good uh, shots with the Coronado. It runs about $600 new. Uh, get them, uh, you know, secondhand around four, five hundred dollars $500. You just want to be careful because the etalons and so forth and some of the filters can rust. You just want to make sure that uh, if you're looking into one, you get a chance to look through it and make sure that uh, everything is good on it. You can take out, take the barrel off, look at the etalon, make sure there's no rust on the glass plates, etc. Uh, Coronado makes the PST, which is 40 millimeter. They also make a 60 and a 90. They use what's called rich field tuning. And I'll talk about tuning because with hydrogen alpha, you have to tune the bandwidth to see all the different parts uh, of the chromosphere. The chromosphere sits above the photosphere and the idea behind these is it blocks all the light out because the photosphere basically makes it too bright to see anything. So what you're seeing is a, a thin layer over top the photosphere, which is where a lot of the action happens. And I'll show you some shots of that and what you're actually looking at. But there's a number of ways that they tune. One is rich field, which they're actually moving these plates to get the bandwidth where you can actually see the things. The other one is pressure tuning. They use pressure to change it. And then there's an, another one that the Lunt uses, which is what I have is called the tilt tune. And you're tilting that along slightly just to get bandwidth where you can. And I'll get into that a little bit. Then it also comes with a blocking filter. This is a necessity. It basically makes sure that the light is safe that's coming through so you can view it, uh, you can image it, etc. And those are a necessary part. What some people do is they'll take parts from these. There's actually a person that's taken the Edelon out of the Coronado and put it in with a much larger telescope and has the correct filters to you know, reject most of the energy coming from the sun, the blocking filters, and uses it on his standard scope. Then the other option, oh, these, by the way, you're looking at, to get into this, this one's about $600. You get into the 60 millimeter lint with pressure tuning, you're over 2,000. The tilt tune is about 1,600. Uh, the 60 millimeter uh, Coronado, I think, runs about 1,300 and 90 millimeter up to about three grand. But lint also makes a 152 uh, up to about $8,000. Then there's the cork uh, eyepiece HA, which is gotten a lot of interest and a lot of people have started using because you don't have to have a ded dedicated scope. You can use it on an existing refractor. Um, it operates, again, you have to have power for this. Um, what I've read and heard from people, they say it's not a big deal, but when you turn it on, you have to wait about 10 minutes for it to come to temperature to bring the bandwidths at. And if you change, if you try to tune it, each time you tune it, there's a waiting period, you know, to look again. But the good thing is for about $1,000, you can get this if you've got like an, you know, a 60, 80 millimeter refractor, you can use this on that. You just use your own diagonal and use this for doing the uh, hydrogen alpha.
And what you're going to see with it, you'll see the prominences are very, very nice. By the way, you can see prominences with the calcium K line. They're very faint, but they are visible. You can't see them. Not to this detail, though. Uh, with the hydrogen alpha, the proms are stand out very nicely. Then on the surface, of course, you see the sunspots. You'll see filaments, which filaments are nothing but proms on the surface. That's why they appear dark. You'll see flares. You'll see the faculi, which are much more pronounced. You'll see phage around the sunspots. And watching a flare is, you know, pretty fascinating. I mean, you can see that pretty much in real time. The first one I saw I was getting ready to image and I happened to be watching a sunspot and all of a sudden you just see this bright thing start to grow. And within, you know, five to 10 minutes, it's grown and, and gone away, etc. cetera. Warren, Warren we, go ahead. We do, we do, we do have one question. question. <clears throat> uh, from Michael Field, if you put white light solar filter film on like the, hold on, I'm sorry. If you put white light solar film like the beta film on in front of your refractor, does it block any of the frequencies that you want to get with other filters like the quark system or the K-line filter? Well, actually, uh, with the K-line, well, the one I talked about, let me go back here real quick. With this one, it comes with the uh, batter film first. So, and this, the look, this is basically a solar, you know, thing. So I would say on this one, no, I honestly couldn't tell you on the hydrogen alpha. I'm not sure. I know you don't use one on hydrogen alpha. Yeah, I think that answers his question. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the things that you might here, particularly if you ask for, hey, I'm, I'm interested in the uh, HA scope, what should I get? They're going to tell you, the first thing is, well, you want to you, you wanna get a, a dual etalon. You want to get a double stack, which basically what that means is they put one more etalon on the front, which is tilt tune, and you've got the other, basically you've got the pressure tune, and I'll, I'll just talk real briefly about that. First off, though, one of the nice things you can do when you see filaments, they're nice when you're looking like this. This is a, you know, a standard. But you can also reverse the image, too. You can invert it. And they come out really nice where you can get kind of a 3D type of image of the uh, how the filaments really look against the surface of the sun. So basically, every, this is a flare over here. It's black because it was white and it's been flipped. But the filaments are come out really nice. And I've seen them to where they stretch almost entirely across the surface of the sun. And you can also colorize them. You know, people say, well, should I get a color camera? No, I'm gonna tell you get a mono camera, et cetera. Uh, and you, but you, cause you can color it in you know, your processing in your Photoshop, you can just add color to it. Uh, this was uh, a problem that a lot of people have imaged. We, we called it the wind blowing Elvis's hair prominence on the side there. And then you can get in, when you get some active regions, sunspots right on the limb, you can get a lot of interesting shots. You'll see a filament over here, small, small, small sunspot, a large group, and you'll see some flare activity happening here, the prominence. You're seeing spicules and these spikes. And this was enough for me to get me, you know, really interested in it. But when you take this, and now this is the same area, and then you take a series of shots over time and you put them together, then this turns into this. And you can see what's happening. This is 30 minutes. So you watch a flare pop up here. You'll see a flare shoot up here. You see coronal rain coming down. You see this prom being sucked back in basically. You know, this is all, you know, the magnetic field, so forth and so on. That's how the problems follow. So this is where I've gotten the biggest kick out of this is what's happening 
I mean, people have asked, well, can you see this when you're watching it live? And I've said, well, kind of. I mean, if I'm watching this, I will see this bright spot start to poke up. But when you're imaging and you're, you're taking these shots, you'll see some, but you don't really realize how much is happening until you put these together, stack them, and put it into an anim animation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the processing. I'm not going deep into it because you can almost do uh, sessions, sessions on the different ways of stacking and processing, but I'm going to touch on some of the areas and then how to get to this step because it really isn't that difficult. It's easy. It just is fairly tedious and you got to have some patience. So what do we need to do for an animation? Well, first off, you got to capture. You got to stack. We're going to do wavelets, basically sharpening. We're going to do alignment of the frames, which is the most tedious area and bring it into for additional processing you want to crop because you don't want blank lines flashing through it you want to make sure that uh, everything looks good you may want to add a black disc I'll show you why uh, other things you might want to do and then turn it into a GIF so this is my setup uh, I've got the uh, lunt 60 it's a tilt tune I've had that for five years now. On top of this is what's called a soul searcher. It's basically a way to align yourself with the sun. It just projects a little image of the sun onto a disc on the back so you know you're aligned. I mean, you can get pretty close. Just watch the shadow of your counterweights till they get as small as possible and you know you're pretty close to the sun. Uh, you don't want to use a finder scope unless it has a solar filter on it. You don't want the full uh, sun coming through that. Then I've got my Orion ED80T. You'll see the uh, Lunt wedge here. And all I have to do is pop that out, slide in the Lunt uh, CA uh, calcium K line, and I can use it for the calcium K. It's on a side-by-side uh, -side mount. Uh, use that. Then this is the uh, Telegizmo uh, solar viewing cover. I use it for another reason. I'll show you why I use that. You need something so you can see your screen, unless, of course, you're fully automated and you're operating it from inside your house, etc. cetera. Uh, this is my computer garage. I built out a foam board and duct tape. Works really well. This is the particular camera I'm currently using. This is a imaging source DMK31. Um, this is a scope stuff uh, 0.5 reducer so I can get a full... Uh, disc through the uh, scope as well. And I'm looking at, I just received a uh, Skyrus uh, 236M. The reason I'm looking at changing this uh, has a top speed of 30 frames per second, which is fine, uh, but I can't get too many frames in about 10 seconds, and I'll you know tell you why that's important in a little bit. Then, of course, you need the uh, hat, keep the sun out of your eyes. Uh, cold drink and about uh, SPF 30 and 50 if you're going to sit out in the sun for a couple of hours imaging that nice to have it's nice to have a pool next to you uh, so after you've been sitting there in the hot sun you can dive in and uh, cool yourself off this is me set up uh, getting ready just to do some H alpha so capture videos best yeah you could take individual shots stack them together uh, they're going to be noisy. You, you know, you're going to miss out on uh, seeing. Again, remember, with solar, as it is with planetary and uh, a lot of other things, seeing is king. If you don't have a steady atmosphere, your image, the sun, is going to look like a wave machine, and it's going to get tough to uh, capture things. With video and at high frame rates, you get lucky seeing. You get lucky capture. Uh, basically, and you're catching it within, you know, sometimes when the atmosphere steadies really quickly, and then the software is going to pick the best frames out of that. The cameras, imaging source, ASI, Flea, QHY, Chameleon, etc. cetera, uh, they're all out there. You can get in uh, to this for about 200 bucks with ASI's 120. Uh, you want to get mono uh, in HA and white light, etc you're really not getting color anyway, and you want to get as many as good a resolution as possible. 
If you want color, you can you know, color that in your processing. Software for capture, probably most frequently used is Fire Capture or Sharp Cap. Uh, the imaging source uh, includes iCap. Uh, there are other programs all out there as well for doing the capture, as long as they capture video. So you want to determine your exposure, your gain, your gamma. And when we talk about that, you're making a decision, am I imaging just the surface, like just a, around a, a sunspot? Am I trying for surface end proms? Or do I have a faint floating prom and I, I don't care if the disc is totally blown out, I want to get it. So you need to you know, set these things for what you want. The way that I do this is I will capture as many frames in 10 seconds as possible at one to two minute intervals. Uh, typically, if I'm doing 30, minute, 30 minutes, I'll do every minute. I'll take a 10 second video. Uh, that usually gets me about 300 frames uh, in my uh, video. And that's why I'm trying to get to uh, a faster frame rate so I can get more frames to get a smoother background. And as I say, I do a 30 minute uh, as a minimum to do my uh, animations. That way I've got at least 30 frames. An hour is nice. You never know what's going to happen when you're doing, when you're doing these. So this is an example of uh, ICAP the capture screen or the uh, software uh, I've got uh, set up for the full disk and almost all of the capture you know works similar you know fire capture has you know the deep red thing they've got the picture over here and all the controls over here but basically you've got your gamma your gain your brightness your exposure which basically is, is a type of frame rate um, you can set up to when you hit record either record a certain amount of frames or record a certain amount of time and it will stop. And the reason you go for 10 seconds is you'll notice that in those uh, animations, in 30 minutes, a lot happens. So if you're trying to capture a long video, you're going to get blurring of your proms or other things because they're moving during that time. So you want to, you work with these to get what you're going to image, looking about where you're going to want to. We're going to be sharpening this up later. Here you'll see I've changed the exposures, the gamma, etc., because I've got a very faint prom here I wanted to take a look at and uh, get some uh, video on that. The next question that always comes up is, how do you guide? <laughs> well, there's one person I do know that has... It's called the Hue Tech High Node or Hinode uh, Solar Guider. It's about $700. It um, attaches to your scope, and what it does is it keeps the disk of the sun. It tracks on the di full disk of the sun. It's not tracking on a, a sunspot or anything like that. It actually keeps the disk going, and that helps to you know keep the disk in. But if you're zooming in on proms and you're you're really getting in there deep even if it moves slightly you're going to get a lot of jumping around it's going to take more to align on it so typically when i'm doing my imaging i've typically polar aligned the night before and i've got good polar alignment and i just use a little bookmark i stick right on the screen and i'll either point at a sunspot or where a prom attaches, et cetera. And every so often I'll tweak it just to bring it back in. So I'm not getting a lot of jumping around that I'm gonna to have to adjust for later when I get all these taken, taken care of. The next question comes up and says, well, can you automate taking these so that you just set the computer up to shoot every minute, 10 seconds, so forth. And I think there is, but I'll tell you that, you know, I do this manually. I sit here and I hit this button 30 or 60 times, depending on if I'm doing 30 minutes or an hour. And the reason I'm doing that is I'm watching the scene. And if I come up on the next minute and I see this surface bubbling like a cauldron, I may wait a while and wait, it calms down, I'll take the next one. Because when you do an animation, you will see these things, those, these things affect them. You'll see them go in and out of focus, they'll flash, they'll flicker. Uh, they can drive you crazy. And so I just 
basically look at it and say, hey, if it doesn't look right, I'm not going to shoot it now. I'm going to throw that frame away anyway. I may wait 30 seconds. Okay, I can take it now. So I wait another minute. It's not really going to make that big of a difference on your animation. So let's say you've been doing this. You've been taking 10-second videos. You're catching anywhere from 300 to 800 to 1,000 frames, and you've done it for 30 minutes. So now you're going to bring it in for stacking and wavelets. Warren? Yes, go ahead. Before you go into that, uh, Basil Rowe has a great question. Any tips, tricks, suggestions for focusing? Oh, oh, good. Okay, yeah. I, good question. The best thing is if you've got a sunspot, you focus. There is, There are no, I mean, I think that uh, fire capture comes with a focus aid, but I think that's more aimed at planetary than anything. With the sun, it's a little different. If you've got a sunspot, that's the best thing to focus on. You'll notice up here, there's a control for zooming in. So I'll zoom in on a sunspot and you know get the best focus I can. And yes, I will check that uh, oh, about every two to three frames just to see how it's going because you're seeing can change, etc. Hopefully you have no thin, wispy clouds going over because that can mess up an animation as well. But you either focus on a sunspot or if you're doing a prom, you can usually see if they're nice and feathery, you just look for the finest focus you can. And that's the best uh, advice I can give. It is. It can be frustrating. If you've got a nice sunspot, it's fairly easy. But if you don't, you just kind of have to go by the finest points of the prominence that you're looking at. Okay? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Okay, you've got all these files. Now, keep in mind, uh, I've got a small camera for my, or, or a small chip on my deep sky one. So my my images, you know, are, you know, four megs per frame. And I think you guys with the larger, you're working with 50, 60 megs. When you're working with these files, you're talking 200 to 700 megs per uh, video. So you've got some big files. So it eats up memory really quick. So you just understand that when you're doing these things, that's why you'll hear people saying, well, shut down this program, shut down that program, because they are very large files. So anyway, you've got, let's say you've got 30 videos. Now you've got to do, you've got to put them in software that's going to take those videos and align the, each of the frames and stack them. It's going to pick the best frames out of it. You're not going to use all 600 typically because there's going to be some change in the seeing, et cetera, as you're doing it. So the main one used is Auto, Auto Stacker. Uh, this is for frame selection and stacking. And it's nice because it does automate the lining and stacking of a high number of, of frames. So, no, so in other words, and I'll talk about this when I get uh, to the, the slide on it, but you can put 30 videos into this and it will go through and align stack and do that part for you. You can, just, you can go out and mow the lawn or do something that while it's working. Then most people then move into Registack to do wavelets for sharpening. I'll get to that. Both programs are free. There are other programs out there for doing these things. These are the two that are used the most. Um, I made a note here about Autostacker. This is great. This has been my experience. It's great as long as there's surface detail. If I'm doing just a prom with a white disc, it has a real hard time with that and does not do a good job. Uh, in my case, I go to Registax for aligning and stacking when it's just a white disc and proms, and I'll tell you why here in just a minute. So this is a screenshot of Auto Stacker. I didn't want to get into, like I said, uh, we're going to run short on time anyway. But Auto Stacker, basically, all you do is you click open, you pick the files you want to take a look at. And since we're doing sun, we're going to be doing surface. You've got other choices here. And my suggestion is, if you're interested, there's plenty of YouTube videos, etc., tutorials on how to use these. But a lot of it is just trial and error. Try the, try the settings, see what comes in, and uh, work from there. But once you've chosen your videos, you click Analyze. It will go through all the frames, 
and it rates them. And then it will come back and it will ask you, okay, oops, excuse me, I need some alignment points. So you have the option of either clicking and putting them in yourself. In this case, I just put place the alignment points in the grid. It nicely takes the limb that I want to make sure is in there and all other places. And then it will go through and do the stacking. I have it put into folders. So I'll have a folder of all the different TIFFs that it comes up with. Uh, you can choose to have them sharpened. It doesn't really do a lot of sharpening to it, just you know, does mild. Or you can say no. And then you can tell it either, I want to do this many frames to stack, or I want this percent. And you'll see how this drops off. About 70% of them look pretty good. So that's where I pick. You might want to pick 50. You might want to pick higher. Uh, again, a lot of this is trial and error. You hit stack. As I said, it does its thing. It runs through the first one, and then it will run every other video through and do the same thing and, and make a, a TIFF out of that uh, video. You then go to Registax, and this is a an image. Uh, it's a video that was stacked. Uh, it would have been... Uh, looks like 273 out of 300 were stacked for this. And you'll see it comes in and it's, okay, I can see a filament, so forth and so on. This is where you use wavelets. And again, with Registax, there are plenty of tutorials out there to, to utilize. I had mentioned that uh, for a white disc and proms, I use this. And the reason I do that is to try to imagine this is a pure white disc and you can see this prom a little bit better. And am I... I may say select this image, and then I'm going to put maybe five to eight anchor points at the base of the prom, and then I'll say align, stack, and it tends to do a better job with fewer points, etc. But anyway, in Registax, then we're going to use wavelets, and the different layers, one through six, you start at one, that's going to work on smaller areas, and up to six works on larger areas. So if I'm doing close-ups, then I'm starting down here and working up. If I'm doing a full disc, I'm going to start up here and work down. But once you slide these, and again, there is a, a lot of trial and error, but you slide them, and this is what the wavelets done. So you go from this to this. Of course, you can play with contrast, brightness, gamma, etc., however you want to. When you're doing this, when you're doing 30 to 60, you know, images, you want to save this particular scheme you're setting up. When you get one, your first one done, you like, okay, I like how this is uh, going to be for my animation. You want to save this scheme so that if you leave, come back, something screwed up, you've still got this scheme, so you're doing exact same wavelets to each image that you're doing. That's real important for an animation. So, you've now got 30 TIFFs. Now we're gonna talk about the alignment and the creation of the GIF. I use Photoshop and I use Advanced GIF Animator, but you can use Photoshop to make your GIF as well. So I'm gonna flip over here to Photoshop and show you what you're going to do with your files. So I'm going to do this with very short because things can take long. But basically, what you do is you go to File, and you go to Scripts. Under Scripts, you want to load files into Stack. And we're going to go find those files. And hope the, there we go. So I've got five here we're going to do to make it really quick. You select those, open, and you will see an option to attempt to automatically align source images. This works really great if you've got surface detail. If you have a pure white disk and proms, it doesn't work at all. It can't do it. So I'm just going to say, okay, I'm not going to click that. And what it will do, it brings them in as layers. And here's the tedious part, and I'm sure there's people out there that could figure a way to get this more automated, but 
this is what I do, guys. I'm going to go up here and I'm just going to blink the eye off and you're going to see it shift. And all I'm going to do is make sure I've got the moving. Blink it off. I know it dropped down. I'm going to move it up a little bit. Blink it. That's going to go that way. Blank. That looks pretty good. You go to the next one. Move that one up. Blink it. And that one's getting pretty good. And you just basically go on down doing that till they're all aligned. And you'll notice as you do this, your frame is moving. So you're, of course, going to want to crop that because when you get to an anim animation, if you have these gaps, you're going to see them flashing all over the outside of your frame, and you don't want that. So after you've done that, you want to crop it. And, you know, really the interesting area is over here. So I'm going to say, okay, crop. Now with me, I don't like this, the bright white disc. It kind of takes away from the prom. So I'm going to go up and do a quick selection. So it selects the white. You can do this a number of ways. You can do it by select color, etc. If I don't want to highlight that, I want to paint the whole thing black. So I'll just use paint bucket and go and I'll paint all these black. So now you've got something that looks like this. Now you've got this pretty much highlighted, etc. You've got that going. When you've got them to where you want them, you've got your disc blacked in or any cropping, etc. Now you want to get it ready to form your GIF. And you do that right in Photoshop. If you go to Window and open this timeline, you get a timeline and you'll see Create Frame Animation. You click on that. You know you're working with the picture. You come over to the little box over here on the lower right, click, and you want to make frames from layers. Okay, basically now you have a GIF ready to go, and I'm going to move over to one that's already done. This is a full hour. Once I've done that, you know, I'll play it and see how it looks. Oops, it's running backwards. I don't want that. So you go back over, reverse frames. Good to go. You'll see the uh, timing down here. You can change that if you want to. Right click, change it. Right now they're at no delay. You can change it to you know a tenth of a second, two cents, and that's fine. The problem I have with that is it doesn't give me a lot of leeway to it. So for me, I'm going to move this into GIF Animator. But if if uh, you like this, you're pretty much done. To get your GIF out, you go to File, Export, and Save for Web. And you go up here and you want to change this to GIF. It'll come up with a preview so you can actually look at it. If you want to cut it down smaller, etc., you can, so forth. Save, you've got your animation. I'm going to cancel that. Jump back over here. And actually, I should go back one more. If you want to go into another program to form your GIF, what you want to do with all these files, you won't have the timeline up if you don't like using it. You're going to go back down to scripts. And this time you're going to choose, you're going to, oh, I can't use it with this one. I can do it with the other one. Hold on. Scripts. Oh, 
Oh, since I've done the timeline, it won't show it. What you will do is basically you, ex you it says export these as files and it will take all of the layers and it will export each one as an individual fi file. Then you can bring it into a program. This is GIF Animator. And I go in, I open, I open up all of the individual images. It comes up with, you know, the images you're ready to go. You play the loop and see how you like it. But this one has a delay of one one hundredth of a second. You know, you can change it a lot. So you can make your video, your animation smoother. Uh, you can you know change the rate, etc. Again, there are other programs that you can utilize for this type of thing, uh, but it's a it's a nice one for getting the timing down. And for using this one, this was one I shot uh, just about a week and a half ago. And you know you've got good seeing when you see these spicules have nice sharp points on them. These things come and go within minutes. Uh, you'll you'll see little blasts. You can see little loops jump out, so forth and so on. And one thing I'll tell people, when you are capturing and you've got time in between, it doesn't hurt to scan the disk of your sun or the edges to see if something else is going on because that happened to me with this one. I was actually imaging this sunspot trying to get some flare activity, and I just happened to start looking at the edge and I saw, suddenly saw this going on. So I said, heck with that, I'm not gonna worry about this thing, not much is happening. I just went ahead and changed. You'll see, here's a filament. Basically we call this a filiprom because it's filament becoming you know, up onto the limb where it's a prom. You see a lot of activity jumping up here, et cetera. You can see the spicules all over the, the surface and so forth. And finally, for all the three types of wavelengths, wavelengths we looked at, so this is what the sun looks like, white light, HA, and your uh, calcium K line, if you look at the same exact sun through three different wavelengths. You can watch how the sunspot, how much larger it is in white light and the calcium K than it was in hydrogen alpha, et cetera. And Adam, that is it. It's real quick. I know it was fast, but uh, any other questions out there? Yeah, that was very cool. Um, yeah, there, are, there were a few questions. Uh, okay. First of all, do you take flats? Any suggestions or recommendations on taking flats through H-alpha? Uh, David's used fire capture, but you have to defocus. Any That's better correct. methods? Yeah, I, I have, I actually, uh, I have not tried them, but the way you're supposed to take a flat in hydrogen alpha is basically uh, zoom in on the surface of the sun, defocus it, get your histogram where you want to, and take the flat. I've not tried it. I have, uh, typically when I start to image, and you'll notice actually in this one, if you look up here, I missed a uh, little dust donut. And those drive me crazy. I have uh, what's called an Arctic butterfly uh, something dust. It's a, a ridiculously expensive uh, dust brush uh, that does a great job of removing uh, dust particles. So before I start imaging, I'll take a look at it. I'll see if I see any dust spots. I'll pull the camera. I'll, I'll clean it with that, put it back up. There's one over here, too. You'll see what uh, I'm saying. And then the one point that uh, I forgot to mention, I, I talked about, this is with 30 frames per second. You can see the background's fairly noisy. And I just did a test with the uh, Skyrus 236M, and I was shooting at uh, 75 frames per second, twice as fast. And the first images I'm looking at, this is like buttery smooth, which is what I want to get to. Uh, so hopefully I'll get some... Uh, nice seeing that I can try some animations with it. I haven't tried yet. Cool. And I, I, the other, in addition to dust motes with solar, sometimes flats, particularly with video, uh, seem to even out the brightness. Correct. Um, and, and also take care of uh, Newton's rings if you happen to get them. Yeah. Luckily, the, other, the other thing with Newton rings, uh, there's ways... There are actually ways to tilt the camera slightly 
Uh, what happens is as, as the uh, wavelength comes in, those Newton rings come because of different alignments and so forth. So a lot of people, uh, I forget what the uh, piece of equipment called, but it's not very expensive, but it allows you to slightly tilt the camera uh, so you can get rid of Newton rings. And then the other thing I can tell you about making sure that brightness is the same as, you know, don't try animations if you've got thin clouds passing over. It'll just, you'll, I mean, you can still get an animation, but your image is going to flash like a strobe just as it goes in and out of the, uh, the clouds and so forth. Um, thank you, Brandon. All, uh, Brandon asked, what are wavelets? And we got a good a answer from Jeff. Okay. It's, it's a compression algorithm that happens to work pretty well for sharpening images. Uh, and basically, it allows you to increase and decrease the contrast based off the scale. And uh, Pix Insight is what we use in Deep Sky stuff. Um, gives you a great way to demonstrate that by separating it into scales. But um, Registax primarily sharpens based on wavelets, so it gives you an active way to uh, kind of uh, watch it as you change them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, when you're using uh, Registax, as you change these sliders, you're going to see the difference in you can decide, well, that's a little too much. I'll back it off, et cetera, uh, while, you're, while you're looking at it before you, you know, decide to set it. Steve Segarian, do people try to capture comets passing the sun? I know that NASA solar site occasionally has that type of capture. Yeah, you, you can only do that, I think, if there's an eclipse. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of how an amateur would achieve that, but... Uh, no, it, it's, the, the wavelengths just won't, you know, if you're doing white light, it's, it's, you're going to block out everything. You know, the sun is so bright, you're, you're bringing, what, uh, one-tenth of the uh, strength of the sun to uh, view it. It's yeah. going to black everything out. Yeah, and I think, uh, what was the NASA uh, satellite or telescope that did it? The... Uh, uh, Solar, what's it called? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Orbiter. Solar. Oh, shoot. It's one you pretty, can, It's pretty impressive. Soho. Yeah. Soho. Yeah, you Soho. You can watch it all day long. <laughs> yeah. Solar. Uh, Soho is. Uh, Soho, right. I, I forget what it stands for. Solar observation something. Uh, either way, it's impressive. Look at it. Um, uh, Joe Sardina actually suggested the starrydave.com for a good place to get a free software that'll help you focus on the sun. So okay. give you a bit of a focus aid. Um, the reason I said that was a good question is that's one of the toughest things. It's hard to get good contrast in H alpha. Uh, well, visually it's hard to get good contrast, but right. even imaging, uh, once it starts warming up and, uh, starts bubbling a little bit, it, it, it could get difficult to tell. Yeah, that was one of the questions that came up on the uh, forum this past week. When do you image? I typically image between about 9.30 and 11.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, wanna, you want the sun to be high enough uh, so that it's out of some of the atmosphere. But if you let it go too long, it heats up. The atmosphere can really mess up the seeing. But you just never know. I, I've heard... You know, some people like, you know, in the later afternoon, most people do morning and late afternoon. Uh, but every once in a while, you know, if the sun's straight overhead, you may have uh, some good seeing as well. Yeah. And uh, one observation I've had is that uh, the seeing is much, much more impacted with solar than oh, it yeah. is with deep sky. So you really see bubbling and cooking. Uh, and it's not just the sun, it's what's between us and the sun. Right, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're uh, shooting over um, any sort of uh, blacktop. <clears throat> roof. <Right. laughs> they say, yeah, roofs. They say shooting over water is actually good, but... Uh, Depends on which way the wind's blowing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that was a great presentation, Warren. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, 
And you guys can check out Warren's stuff on uh, Astrobin or Cloudy Nights. I think that's where most of the solar guys post, as we were joking about earlier, in the Solar Imaging and Observing Forum, I think is what it's called. Yeah, it's, it's actually in the Observing Forum under Solar yeah. Observing and Imaging. <laughs> yeah, so they, they tuck the solar guys off in the corner. Yeah. But uh, they are there, and uh, you'll see lots of cool stuff being posted there, particularly the animations, which kind of just blow my mind. Um, I have a question um, for Warren. Um, yeah. Do you have any suggestions for the eclipse, or should we people stay out of it and just visually observe it? Well, that's yeah, yeah. I would say visually observe it. If you're gonna, you know, if you're going to photograph it, just use a camera. Get a small, inexpensive. I, that's what I've got. I've got a small, inexpensive uh, batter film that I'm going to put on my 135, so I can get a launch of it and have it automated. I don't have to do anything. Uh, so many people said, I want to get an H alpha scope for the eclipse. Well, all you're going to get is, you, I mean, it's nice to have the H alpha, but you're just going to see a black disc coming across. It's not going to show anything that you can't see with your naked eye once the eclipse hits, once it goes totality. Actually, actually, I don't think it's going to show anything. No, it won't. Well, you could see the proms maybe on the edge. Yeah, you'll you'll see the proms, but you won't see the you won't see corona. <laughs> yeah, it just cuts out too much light. Right. The, the warning about um, okay, I've taken several solar eclipses, uh, total solar eclipses, and everything that Warren just talked about, all those excellent points he made about how to process it, how to take the images and everything else are fine. And you can do all that stuff and get all the, do exactly that stuff for the uh, partial phases. The thing is, you're just gonna get a great big uh, circle eaten out of it by by the edge of the moon, you know, by, by the moon itself. So you, it is solar photography. It's exactly solar photography. The reason people are saying don't, take pictures during the eclipse is it's for some people the first of a lifetime hopefully not one of a lifetime once in a lifetime but the first in a lifetime chance to see an eclipse and too many people have gone out to take a picture of the eclipse and they realize they're not quite in focus and they start focusing and they do this and that and the other thing or they're not quite centered or they're not this or that or the other thing and they forget to look at the eclipse and that's why people are warning other people not to take pictures of uh, the eclipse itself um, the other thing to remember is that everything that warren just showed us is how to get pictures of the edge of the sun or the center of the sun and so you want your camera set up to do just that when in a solar eclipse you want to be able to actually capture the sun, yes, but the field around the sun is probably more important. You can capture the sun anytime. It's the field around the sun, the big coronas, uh, the corona and stuff that you want to see. So that's why people advise staying away from trying to photograph your first solar eclipse. Agreed. Thank you, Alex. Um, so if uh, uh, Dave is pointing out the ZWO device that you can use to tilt your camera slightly to get rid of Newton rings, which, I don't know, can sneak up on you at any point. Uh, usually it's one particular configuration in your setup that gives them to you, but that's what happened to me. Um, I do want to point out next week, Basil Rowe will be on to talk a little bit about astrometry. So uh, if you want to see us next week, you know what time to get us. Uh, definitely suggest doing it from our website, but you can also subscribe to us on YouTube and you'll get notified of all of our videos. Uh, and that is basically it for tonight. So I do want to one more time thank Warren. And uh, I guess I'll see you next week. Good night, guys.